All right, so here we are. We've already talked about kind of the need to have some type of properties in order to calculate limits in a more algebraic way, that you're not always going to have the graph to look at or a graphing calculator. So in several cases, we had the properties that we've already discussed that we've been using. But now I want to talk about some kind of basically algebraic techniques. We've seen a few of them already, kind of in our notes that we're working through, but now I want to kind of put them together into a comprehensive list of the different algebraic techniques that you would need to be familiar with. Now, the first algebraic method that we're going to look at, and that's the one that you're going to be most familiar with, and we love this one, this idea of direct substitution. Now, we'll talk about this part in the next section, but there is this idea that as long as you have a function that is continuous, at the place where you are trying to calculate the limit, then you basically can just do this idea of direct substitution. And it makes it very easy for us to calculate the limit. Now, kind of when will it not work? When does direct substitution not work? Well, if I get 0 over 0, I should also say a number over 0 as well. Anytime you have division by 0, then it would be not continuous there. And so that would throw it out. But there's also kind of an indeterminate form of infinity over infinity. I mentioned this here, but this will really be, we're going to do this in section 2.5, when we talk about what we call infinite limits. So this will come up there. And then I say that most of the time, that if you don't get this form, this form, or I should say a number divided by 0, which is another case of a discontinuity, then most of the time, direct substitution will work. Now, the reason I say 99 out of 99 and a half times is the idea that you could have this idea of a piecewise function where I could have the limit trying to approach a fence value, which is where you're switching one piece to the next. And you can plug it in and get a value, but because the left and the right pieces aren't going to the same spot, then the direct substitution is not going to work. So I just want to kind of qualify that, that you have to kind of be careful and that's why I say 99 out of 99 and a half times. Now, and when direct substitution does not work, we'll talk about the idea of removing the bad guy factor from the denominator. But the problem is the division by zero. And we'll talk about the different types of discontinuities that you would see there and kind of some techniques for calculating it when we can remove the bad guy factor. All right, so example one, these are going to be the nice, easy, straightforward examples. And the trick is, is not to let the fractions bother you. This fraction is undefined at x equal to 0. It's OK at 4. And so I don't really care what's happening at 0. I only care what's happening around 4. So the fact that around 4, this is continuous, there's no discontinuity anywhere except at 0, then I know I can simply just do a direct substitution. So if I want to calculate the limit, in this case, calculating the limit is, plug the number in and see what you get. So we have square root of 4 over 4 squared, 2 over 16, or 1 8. So in other words, it doesn't matter what's happening elsewhere. It only matters what's happening at 4. And this function is continuous at 4, so we're perfectly fine with plugging it in. Okay. Now over here, same kind of idea here. Now, of course, this means that you have to recall what your cosecant functions look like. Cosecant is the reciprocal of your sine. And your sine function, you would have, your cosecant would kind of look like this. It's a one little period sketch here. And it would have asymptotes at 0, pi, and 2 pi. So the idea is, is that 5 pi over 3 is in the domain of the cosecant of x. And we talked about this in, as one of your properties, that as long as this value is in the domain, then you can calculate it by direct substitution. So we're simply going to do the cosine, cosecant of 5 pi over 3. Now, of course, you need to know your unit circle, and you need to be able to calculate this. You don't want to miss a multiple choice question, which is where you might see something like this, not because you don't understand the calculus, but because you can't remember your trig properties, your trig identities, or your special ratios. Okay, so just a quick reminder, 5 pi over 3 is in quadrant 4, where the cosecant is negative. We also know that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, and the sine in the pi over 3 family is square root of 3 over 2, so the reciprocal would be 2 over square root of 3. Now, you could alternately have written 2 square root of 3 over 3 if you like to rationalize, but calculus, especially the AP test, 
we don't really focus on the simplification or the rationalization of these numbers. They, they accept this number and that's fine. You do not need to simplify or rationalize numbers. You can leave them in their unrationalized form. So they'll take both answers, whichever one you prefer. All right, and then down here in our last example, again, this fraction, when we go to plug things in, it's only undefined at zero. So the fact that I'm going to 10 doesn't affect me that it's undefined at zero. I can try the direct substitution, sine of 10 over 10, and then I'm pretty much done. You know, you're like, well, wait a minute. I don't know what the sine of 10 is. It doesn't matter. In calculus, we don't have to simplify. Sine of 10 is some irrational, non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. You type it into your calculator. They don't care about that. They just want to know that you know that you can just do the direct substitution. Here's your answer, and we're done. So we have 1 8 for the first one, our negative 2 over root 3 for the second one, and sine of 10 over 10 for your third one. And then also kind of a note as we are doing these, if you are using a calculator, in calculus, your calculator should be in radian mode at all times. They don't ever really do anything in degree mode when they're, when they're dealing with your calculus. All right, so that's kind of the, hey, it's continuous at that point. Let's just use our direct substitution. So we'll make a little note over on the side. Direct substitution if continuous at x equal to c. Don't care what happens elsewhere. Doesn't have to be a continuous function. It just has to be continuous at that value. Okay, then we come over here to, well, what happens when we start getting discontinuity? Now, the first kind of discontinuity, easiest one, is the vertical asymptote, where you have a non-removable infinite discontinuity. This one is the easiest one to deal with because whenever you try to do a direct substitution, you do get the zero in the denominator, which is telling you that this is a domain restriction and a discontinuity. But what you get in the numerator is some non-zero real number, a number divided by zero. What that tells me whenever I get this is that whatever bad guy factor is in the denominator, it is not removable. So, and this is not really technical, you know, calculus terms, but you'll just kind of give me a go with me on this so I can just tell you which factor I'm talking about. The bad guy factor is the one that causes the division by zero. And in this case, the bad guy factor is not removable. There's no way to get it out and it causes a vertical asymptote on the graph. And as we learned in a previous section, anytime you have x approaching a value where there is a vertical asymptote, your limit will not exist. Okay, so when I go over here, the first thing I start to do is in my head I go, I'm going to plug in this one. And I go, wait a minute, I have division by zero. Clearly not continuous there. So now I come over here on the side, or kind of below it, because I, this is not what the limit is going to equal. I am now just plugging in the value, not to calculate the limit, but to give me some information about what's happening on the graph there. So I take the 1, I plug it in the top, I get 1 cubed plus 1. 1 minus 1 gives me 2 over 0. And what I do is I look at this form and I say, what did I get? If I get a number over zero, a non-zero number over zero, then I know I can conclude that there's a vertical asymptote at x equal to one. And as soon as I know that, I can come up here and say, well, this limit does not exist. Now, could I do the left and the right limits and talk about going either up to infinity, down to negative infinity? Yes. And that would be a very simple check. All you have to do is basically plug in a number a little bit before one, plug in a number after one, and basically see whether you're going up or you're going down. Uh, kind of do the idea of a sign chart, which we will come back to in, uh, in many times in calculus. We'll start looking at this idea of a sign chart. But for this, we're done. It doesn't exist. As long as you get non-zero over zero. Same thing here. Now, if you recall your tangent function, and so there's kind of two ways to look at this. I can think about the graph of the tangent function that you should know and should have memorized all your trig graphs, parent graphs from before. It has an asymptote at pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and every pi over 2 plus pi k. So over here at 3 pi over 2 and so on. And then your tangent graph looks something like this coming across in the middle. Okay. So if I go to pi over 2, I know from my knowledge of the graph that I have a vertical asymptote. Now, how does this work for the whole idea of a non-zero number over zero? 
Well, recall that tangent of x by your trig identity is sine of x over cosine of x. So if I were to actually plug in pi over 2, I would have sine of pi over 2 over cosine of pi over 2. Why am I getting undefined for tangent of pi over 2? Because the sine of pi over 2 is 1. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. There's my real number, non-zero real number, divided by 0, which is telling me that there's a vertical asymptote at x equal to pi over 2. So again, once we know that, we can write it does not exist, and we're done, and we can move on with that one. Same thing over here. We have x over sine of x, and we're taking the limit as x approaches pi. Now, again, I'm going to do the direct substitution. I don't really know anything about this graph like I did over here. But I'm going to just do the direct substitution. I know that I can't do the limit using direct substitution because when I try to plug pi into the denominator, I am going to get a 0 in the denominator. So I'm going to bring this down here. This is not equal to this. I am using this information to help calculate the limit. When I get to this piece, I know that this is pi divided by sine of pi, which is 0. Non-zero real number divided by 0. Therefore, there's going to be a vertical asymptote at x equal to pi on whatever this graph looks like. And once I know that, I can say does not exist. All right, so so far we've looked at what happens when the function is continuous at x equal to c. We've looked at what happens when the function is discontinuous and we know that it is an infinite discontinuity of vertical asymptotes. How do we calculate the limit? Now what we're going to look at is the special case of when is it a removable discontinuity. Now specifically we're going to be looking at instead of getting a non-zero number over zero, I'm going to get zero over zero. This is your clue that you know that you're going to have what is probably a removable discontinuity. Not always, but in most cases, okay? So the idea here is going to be that we're going to look at all these different types of functions and strategies for what, the, what would happen if you get 0 over 0. Now, this method number 3, which is basically, if you'll read here at the top, we are going to factor. We're going to look for a common factor and cancel it out. So in other words, you're going to have a factor in the bottom, the bad guy factor. And because it makes both the top and the bottom zero, we know it's a factor of both the numerator and the denominator. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove it by factoring it out. And what we have seen in our precalculus is that that cancellation, that if I can remove the factor causing the problem in the denominator, it's a removable point discontinuity, also known as a hole on the graph, and that that whole location, remember we don't care what happens at x equal to c, we only care about what happens before and after. So the limit exists, but we want to be able to say, well, how can I find it? Well, this goes into a theorem, and it's pretty straightforward. The idea is, is for you to understand that if I have a function f of x, that I then remove the bad guy factor. and it gives me a function g of x. Now, g of x and f of x are, are not the same function. They are going to be the same everywhere except at that one point, which is where the bad guy factor was equal to zero. And notice that, remember, that when we're calculating a limit, we don't care what happens at x equal to c, the value that causes the bad guy factor to be zero. We only care what happens before and after. And since f of x and g of x, while they're not exactly the same functions, they have the same behavior before and after c. And if that's the case, we can use g to find the limit for f because it has the same behavior before and after. So our basic theorem says something along these lines. So we're going to let c be a real number. And that's where we're interested in the limit. And if we know, through our simplification process, that f of x equals g of x 
I'm going to say on some open interval around C, except possibly at C. So the idea is, is that I don't care the fact that maybe f of x is not defined at c, but g of x is. All I care about is they are essentially the same function, except at that value. And that means they have the same left behavior, the same right behavior. And what that lets us conclude, okay, so if I know c is real, the two functions are the same on some open interval around c, it doesn't even have to be the whole entire function are the same, only really close to c, because we're doing limits and we only care about a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. That if I want to calculate the limit, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x can be calculated using the limit as x approaches c of g of x. And we actually saw this in previous notes as well, because this is kind of one of those common sense ones when we're looking at. So here's my first example. I'm doing the limit as x approaches 2. Now again, I'm going to start because I know I can't just do direct substitution because I have 0 in the denominator. But I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to come over here to the side. I'm going to plug it in. 2 squared minus 4. 2 minus 2. Just to see what kind of division by 0 it is. Whether it is the vertical asymptote or one that is possibly removable. 2 squared, 4 minus 4, 0 over 0. There's that indeterminate form. And I know that in this case, okay, remember this is kind of our special case up here. This method is ideal when you have a rational function and the ratio of two polynomials. So clearly I have rational function, fraction, polynomial over polynomial. So the strategy says factor, remove the bad guy factor, and then use the reduced function to find the limit. Now again, we want to use good math communication. So we are going to take our limit and we're going to bring it over here and write it because I'm not taking the limit yet. Right now I am algebraically manipulating this into an alternate form that I can use to calculate the limit. So I have x squared minus 4 factors, x plus 2, x minus 2, x minus 2. We see that the bad guy factor in the bottom, x minus 2, is also a factor at the top. I'm going to remove the bad guy factor. Now, I still have not done the limit yet. All I'm doing is manipulating the function. Now, I'm going to write this down, and I can keep doing this, and I can say that these two things are equal, not because these two functions are equal. These two functions are not the same, the arguments of the limit. They are the same everywhere. except at x equal to 2. And that meets the requirement of my theorem up here. It says I don't really care what happens at x equal to 2. I just want to make sure they're the same before and after 2. And since they are the same, I can't use direct substitution here because I have a division by 0 problem. But now over here, this function is continuous at x equal to 2. I can use the direct substitution. And I can calculate my limit simply by plugging the 2 in and getting my answer. The limit on this will be the same as the limit on this original function, so the answer is going to be 4. Likewise, over here, we'll come over here to the side. I know that I can't use direct substitution because when I go to plug this value of 1 in, it does not work. I get division by 0. I want to check. I want to see, well, what kind of division by 0 do I get? I get 1 cubed minus 1, 1 minus 1, 0 over 0, which tells me that I can use an alternate strategy, which is polynomial over polynomial in a rational function. I'm going to need to factor. Now this might, you know, a little bit of algebra review is always good when we're looking at this. Bring your limit, because we haven't calculated it yet. This factors, and one of the factors, is going to be x minus 1. Now if you don't remember your difference of perfect cubes factoring forms, you might want to go review that at this time. Remember, there's a difference of perfect cubes and the sum of perfect cubes. So you need to have those memorized. And this factors to x squared plus x plus 1. And then our factor at the bottom, x minus 1. Once we get it in factored form, we can remove the bad guy factor. I still have not taken the limit. 
I have found a function that is the same as the original function everywhere except at x equal to 1. Okay, so same everywhere except x equal to 1. So I know that if I want to, all I can, if I can calculate this limit, then I know the original limit that I was trying to find. And this limit is easy because I can use direct substitution now. 1 squared plus 1 plus 1. My final answer is 3. All right, let's take a look at our last example here. Again, throwing in some things, kind of review some algebra as we go. Uh, I try to plug in my negative 1. Again, I'll come over here on the side. I know that I can't use direct substitution because when I put negative 1 in the denominator, I'm going to end up with 2 minus negative 1 plus 1 minus 3, which is going to give me a 0 in the denominator. All right, now I check the numerator to see what's going to happen there. Negative 1 to the 4th is 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1, but it's negative, so it becomes plus 1. Negative 1 squared is 1, so minus 1. Negative 1 times negative 3, plus 3, minus 4. We check that. We end up with 2 minus 1, which is 1. 1 plus 3 is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. Indeterminate form. Direct substitution doesn't work but it's not a vertical asymptote, let's go see if it's removable. So we need to factor both the top and the bottom. Now obviously the denominator is easier to factor. All right, so I'm going to come down here. The denominator factors. We have a 2x and an x. We need a 3 and a 1. Let's do 3 and 1 here because I don't want to have a 6. I want it to end up with a minus 1 here. Minus plus. And so the bad guy factor is this x plus 1. And because I got 0 over 0, I know that x plus 1 has to be a factor of the numerator as well. So now my goal is going to be to factor this numerator. Now, I'm not sure if you recall from your pre-calculus, but if you remember synthetic division or we can use long division in order to factor this. Okay, so let's do a little quick review. Synthetic division, we have our 1 here, which tells us that the 0, or the thing that's causing the problem, is negative 1. So we bring down our negative 1, the little L bracket here to separate it. Then we bring down our coefficients for all our numbers up here. So we have 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 3, negative 4. Then we draw a little bar right here. Your first step in your synthetic division, drop your 1 down. Then you multiply this number times the negative 1, gives you negative 1. Add these two numbers, minus 2. Then you take this number times that number, 2, add 1. This number times that number, negative 1, add negative 4. Multiply 4, add 0. Now, because we already knew that this was a factor, we are expecting to get 0 here, because that's your remainder. And then we can translate this back into our polynomial. Now, remember, what happens is this was a degree 4, so this will be a degree 3. So it would be 1x cubed minus 2x squared plus 1 x, so plus x and then minus 4. And now we have it in factored form. So at this point, I will remove the bad guy factor. Again, see, all I'm doing is algebra. Uh, just before I move on, uh, really quick, if you wanted to do long division, you could do that as well, where you take the x plus 1 and divide into your polynomial x to the fourth minus x cubed minus x squared minus 3x minus 4 x goes into x to the fourth, x cubed. Multiply x to the fourth minus x cubed. Subtract. This cancels, this cancels. So I'm just going to bring down the rest. 3x minus 4. x goes into negative x squared minus x times. Multiply minus x squared minus x. Subtract. These two cancel. Negative 3x plus x is negative 2x, bring down your minus 4, x goes into negative 2x, 
minus 2. All right, did I make a mistake somewhere in there? x to the fourth minus x cubed. All right, let me pause for a second. I've... Okay, as you can see, teachers are, you know, we make mistakes too. My mistake was, I'm going to erase all this down here. My mistake was, it was when I multiply x cubed times x plus 1, it's x to the fourth plus x cubed. And then I'm going to subtract. So the x to the fourth cancel. Then I have a negative x cubed minus an x cubed, which is minus 2x cubed. It was a little too nice that those, both of those canceled out. Bring down the rest. Then I'm going to, oh, I need to erase the other things up here at the top, too. All right, so we have minus, I need a minus 2x cubed. So x goes into minus 2x cubed, minus 2x squared, multiply. Minus 2x cubed minus 2x squared. Track. So now I feel like I need to be super careful so I don't make an algebra mistake again. These cancel. Negative x squared plus 2x squared, which is going to give me negative plus 2x squared. Bring down the rest. Minus 3x minus 4. x goes into x squared x times, multiply, x squared plus x, subtract, negative 3x minus x minus 4x minus 4. That's why I like synthetic division a little bit better for these. And then we take our x goes into minus 4x minus 4, multiply, minus 4x minus 4, and when we subtract, we get 0, and it works out. Okay. So either method, you choose which one you prefer in terms of factoring. Now, going back to our problem, we did all that work so that we could remove the bad guy factor. Once I have removed the bad guy factor, I still have not taken the limit, so bring it along. x cubed minus 2x squared plus x minus 4 over 2x minus 3. You're like, great, what do I know? I know that the original function and this simplified function, they're the same everywhere except at x equal to negative 1. And look, this negative 1 doesn't cause a division by 0 problem. So at this point, I can just substitute it in. And of course, I've also managed to run out of room, so I'll come right above this and just say equals. I can now do my direct substitution. Negative 1 cubed, negative 1 minus 2 times negative 1 squared, which is going to be 1 minus 2, plus negative 1 minus 4, over 2 times negative 1, negative 2, minus 3, which is going to give me, let's see, all of these are negative, so 5, 6, 7, negative 8, over negative 5, or 8 fifths. And that's my final answer. So again, the idea is I picked this one because I wanted to show you synthetic and long division, do a little review of that. All right, now taking a look at the next strategy. Again, we're still working with those removable point discontinuities. We still have the 0 over 0 in determinant form. However, now you're not going to have a ratio of a polynomial over a polynomial. Like in this example down here that you're looking at, this top is not a polynomial because it has a radical in it. So this technique, this RATCON technique, is that when we look at this and we look for when we have the sum or difference of some radical terms. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to multiply by a form of 1, which remember that whenever you multiply by 1, it doesn't change it. It gives you something equivalent, except maybe at the value C, because you know it may become defined when before it was undefined that this multiplying by this clever form of a conjugate over a conjugate may help us out. So let me kind of show you how this strategy works. So I look over here. Again, I'm going to try direct substitution first. But I realize that when I try to do the direct substitution, I get 0 in the denominator. I check what happens in the numerator. I get square root of 0 plus 1, square root of 1 minus 1, which is 0 over 0. So there's my indeterminate form. Pretty sure that this is going to be a removable discontinuity. I look at it, okay, darn, it's not a polynomial or polynomial, factoring is not going to work. Then I go, let's do the conjugate. So this form of 1, 
and we're going to add this right here next to it because I can multiply kind of in here by this form of 1. Now the form of 1 I want to be the conjugate. Remember that the conjugate, if I have a plus b, the conjugate is going to be a minus b. So that's what we're looking for. So I take the radical binomial, the two terms where one of them is a radical, and I'm going to do the conjugate of that. So I'm going to multiply by square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And whatever I do to the top, I have to do to the bottom. And that's my form of 1. That essentially taking an expression and multiplying it by 1 is not going to change the expression except maybe at the discontinuity. And let's see what happens when I do that. Now I'm going to focus on the top here first. And we're going to remind ourselves that because this is a binomial times a binomial, our nice little distribution or foiling process is going to come into play here. I'm going to do equals. Don't forget your limit. We have not taken the limit yet. We are just algebraically playing around with our function to try to turn it into a better form or an equivalent function that does not have the discontinuity. So I multiply square root of x plus 1 times square root of x plus 1 is x plus 1. Then we have minus the square root of x plus 1 plus the square root of x plus 1. They cancel out. That's why we're doing the conjugate. So the middle terms are going to go away. And then our last term, minus 1 times 1, gives me minus 1. Now a lot of times, the bottom part, don't multiply it out. The reason is, is because we're trying to get rid of the bad guy factor. Remember, the bad guy factor is here. So I don't want to distribute it through and muddy the waters down here at the bottom. I want to keep the bad guy factor out so that I can cancel it. Now very nicely, if you look at your top and you simplify, remember I still haven't taken the limit yet, I'm just manipulating the function, I now have on the top x and then x times square root of x plus 1 plus 1. I've gotten it to a point where I have a common factor between the top and the bottom and I can cancel the bad guy factor out. Now remember what's left here when you cancel? your 1, so go ahead and put that in. And we'll come down. I still have not taken the limit. I am left with a function, 1 over square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Now, this technique does the same thing that the whole factoring and removing a common factor does. This original function that I had and this new function that I have turned into here, they are the same except at x equal to 0, because before this was undefined at x equal to 0, gave me that indeterminate form, but now at x equal to 0, this one's defined. And you go, hey, wait a minute, that means I can use direct substitution. So now I can calculate the limit by doing the direct substitution and plugging in the 0, 1 over square root of 1 plus 1, or 1 half, and I have my limit algebraically. All right, let's do one more example of that on the next page to show this one. Uh, I picked this one mostly because I have to remind you, remember your uh, rational exponents, that a one-half power is a square root. If it helps you, you can kind of just remember or just rewrite here below it. This is the square root of x plus 1 minus 2. I try to plug in. You can always start with that direct substitution. I am plugging in 3. So I do 3 plus 1, so on the square root of that, minus 2. So in the denominator, whoopsie, there we go, division by 0. I check the top, because I want to see whether it's a vertical asymptote or not. So I plug in my 3 minus 3, and I do get the indeterminate form 0 over 0. So I know that, okay, probably removable. Not 100%, but probably. I look at it and say, hey, I have a radical. Let's multiply by the conjugate. So within here... I'm going to add that form of 1 in. Remember, it's going to be the conjugate, so it's going to be square root of x plus 1. And instead of minus 2, I'm going to do plus 2. Whatever you do to the bottom, you need to do to the top. So we multiply by the same thing here. So this is going to be my form of 1. Now again, when you're looking at this, where you're going to distribute is you're going to do the foiling on the radical binomial. So first, there's my last, and remember the inner and the outer 
should cancel out. So I can kind of ignore those. So I really only need the first and the last. So I bring my limit along as x approaches 3. The first times the first is going to give me x plus 1. The last times the last is going to give me minus 4. Now again, the bad guy factor, if you remember, because it's 3, is going to be this x minus 3. So I'm going to leave the bad guy factor. I'm not going to multiply it through. I'm going to leave that in factored form because this is my target for getting rid of. And then very nicely here, the bottom is going to simplify, limit as x approaches 3. I have the bad guy factor, square root of x plus 1 plus 2, and then this x minus 3. So I have got it to the point where I can cancel and remove the bad guy factor. That gives me, come down here, the limit as x approaches 3 of the square root of x plus 1 plus 2. The original function, the new function, they are the same everywhere except that x equal to 3. I can now use my direct substitution, calculate the limit, square root of 3 plus 1 plus 2, square root of 4, 2 plus 2, which is for my final answer. All right, our fifth algebraic strategy. Mostly this one's going to come in when you have complex fractions. Okay, we're still working in the zero over zero indeterminate form case where we have a removable point discontinuity. But in this case, we don't have a rational function that's a polynomial over a polynomial. We don't have radicals involved, but what we notice is that we have fractions in fractions. And this one, we're still going to utilize that multiply by a nice form of 1, but that clever form of 1 is going to be the least common multiple divided by the least common multiple, your common denominator, the smallest common denominator of all the denominators in the fraction. All right, now in this example, so I look at it, let's do our test. We try to do direct substitution because that's what we want to start with. When I plug the 0 into the denominator, I get 0. When I plug the 0 into the numerator, I get 1 half minus 1 half, 0 over 0. So I know it's not a vertical asymptote. I know that I have to use another technique, indeterminate form, removable discontinuity. So within the limit here, I'm going to choose to multiply by a nice form of 1. I put my parentheses in. And it needs to be the least common multiple of the denominator. So I only have these two denominators up here that I'm really looking at. So my least common multiple would be 2 times 2 plus x. They don't have anything in common. And I'm going to multiply that times the top, and I'm going to multiply that times the bottom. Now on the top, we are going to distribute, and we'll do this. All right, that's going to do the limit as x approaches 0. Now the reason that we do this is because notice what happens to this fraction up here. I have a common factor, the 2 plus x is going to cancel, and I'm left with 2 times 1, so I get a 2. And then over here, the fraction and the 2 are going to cancel, and that's going to leave me with minus, now make sure you put your parentheses, 2 plus x. And notice that what I did when I multiplied this LCM times the top, all your fractions in the numerator should go away. Now in the bottom, I am not going to multiply it out, because remember, you're looking to get rid of the bad guy factor. And the bad guy factor is the x, so I'm not going to multiply that through. I'm going to leave it by itself on the bottom. I'm going to simplify the top. So you get 2 minus 2, which is going to go away, and then minus x here. And then I have the 2x, 2 plus x on the bottom. So now I have it in completely factored form. I can cancel out the x's. They're going to go away. This is going to be left with this negative 1 here. So the equivalent function, the function that is the same everywhere except at 0, is going to be negative 1, 2, 2 plus x. And now, since this has no problem with 0, I can plug it in. I will plug it in, evaluate the limit with direct substitution, negative 1 over 2 2 plus 0, which is going to give me negative 1 fourth. Right. B and C, I'm going to let you try those on your own, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll kind of check our answers on that. 
Now remember that a negative exponent is really 1 over, so you do want to change these to fractions, and then use the same technique that I did here. Multiply by an appropriate form of 1, and then we'll come back and we'll check your answers. So pause the video and work those problems. Okay, now that we've come back, here are the answers uh, for the two problems. Check and make sure that you have written the limit in front of each term until you actually did the direct substitution. The direct substitution is where you plug it in to actually calculate the value. So until you plug in zero, you write the limit in front. So you want to have good math communication. You don't want to lose credit because of poor math communication on the AP. Same thing down here. Here's my form of 1 and our final answer here. All right, so now let's take a look at the next technique uh, called the sledgehammer, mostly because this one is a lot of work. That there is no form of 1 that we can multiply. And what happens is we kind of have a polynomial-ish in the top and the bottom. However, it's not nice. It's not in a form that's easy to factor. So the idea is, is that sometimes you have to mess things up in order to collect them back together in a nicer fashion and then refactor. So you have to distribute it out, then you collect like terms, and then you refactor the nicer version after some things have canceled. And again, this is going to be a method that you're going to know you're going to have to use if you have a 0 over 0 case, like in this example. Notice in this one I'm doing the limit as h approaches 0. So I'm plugging in 0 for h. I get x plus 0 squared minus x squared over 0. And in the top is going to be x squared minus x squared 0 over 0. I got that indeterminate form, which tells me it's a removable discontinuity in most cases. And then I go, okay, what's obvious here? The obvious part here is that there's some math to do. That there's going to be some foiling out here, collecting like terms. So that's what we're going to do on this strategy. So we bring our limit along. I'm going to expand the binomial. So it's going to become x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus your x squared, all divided by h. And then we're going to look and see, well, does something happen in here? Once I expand it out, are there any like terms? So there's an x squared and a minus x squared that's going to actually cancel out here. And I notice that what I have left, every term in the top, has a factor of h squared. So it's like you start now, you're looking for the GCF. And the GCF from here is going to be this h, the bad guy factor. I'm now going to be able to factor it out. So I'm... Now, I still write the limit. I have not taken the limit yet. I'm still playing around with the expression to try to get it into a nicer form. I'm going to pull the bad guy factor out of the top. 2x plus h would be what's left over h. And once I have the bad guy factor pulled out, I can remove him. Now, that gives me a limit that has a function that it is okay to plug in. I can now use direct substitution because there's no division by zero anymore. I have removed it. This expression and this expression are considered the same everywhere except h equal to zero. So I can now use my direct substitution, 2 times zero, oops, and I did exactly what you guys are going to do. I'm not plugging it in for x, I'm plugging it in for h, so it's 2x plus zero, and my final answer is 2x. Now notice that in this problem, I did not get an actual number there for the limit, but this is going to be kind of heading into some techniques that we're going to use for finding what we call derivatives. That this limit depends on x. If I know what x is, then this will be a number. So if x is 5, then I would know that, oh, okay, then the answer is going to be 10. If x was 8, then I know the answer is going to be 2 times 8 or 16. So it depends on your answer, depends on x, but it is something that you can calculate. You still complete the process. All right, let's do one more example for this. This one just has a little bit more algebra to do. I take a look at it. I'm going to plug in my 0. Okay, again, we're just checking to see what our form is. The denominator is 0, so I'm checking the top to see if it also gives me a 0. If it didn't give me a 0 in the top, if you got something with x's in it that did not equal 0, then you would say, oh, hey, then it's does not exist. But if I do plug in 0 for h, we get x squared 
minus 2x plus 1 minus x squared minus 2x plus 1, which is 0 over 0. So that's that indeterminate form. I look at it and I say, well, there's some obvious things to do here. I can distribute or expand the binomial, distribute here, make sure you distribute this negative through. Let's see what happens. We'll do the algebra. So I haven't taken the limit, so I bring that along. Expand the binomial, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 2x minus 2h. Don't forget to bring the negative with you here. Plus this 1. Then distribute the negative. Minus x squared plus 2x minus 1. And if you have done these correctly, okay, things will collect like terms and things will cancel out. So we have a plus x squared and a minus x squared, a minus 2x and a plus 2x, plus 1 and minus 1. So I take a look at the terms that I have left, which is these two plus this one. And what do you notice is the GCF, the bad guy factor, is in all three of these terms that are left. So I can pull that out, the limit as h approaches 0, h, 2x left here, 1h left there, minus a 2 there. Now I can remove the bad guy factor, cancel it out, and we end up with 2x plus h minus 2, which is now, okay, there's no division by zero problem. I can use direct substitution, plug it in, and calculate your limit, 2x plus 0 minus 2, or 2x minus 2. Again, another example where your final answer depends on x, but we can take the limit. Okay, we're going to stop this section of notes here, and we will. The next part is dealing with some uh, trig rules, and the trig ones I think I'll do on a separate day. So I'll stop it there and finish up the algebraic manipulation where it's mostly algebra type methods.